welcome, Tracy, to Deep Into Sleep. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so glad that we can connect over, you know, internationally. I know you are in UK and I'm in California. Yeah, and I think it helps that I'm an early bird and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the circadian rhythm definitely aligns perfectly. I'm night owl, you're early bird, that's great. You're morning and well. night. Before we start, how about you introduce yourself a little bit to our audience, whoever is listening sure. and watching? Sure. Um, well, my name is Tracy Hannigan, and I live just outside of London in the UK. Um, I became interested in CBTI when I was suffering with insomnia and used CBTI myself um, to kind of help me on my recovery journey. Um, and I'm a healthcare practitioner here in the UK, and I'm an osteopath. And in my clinical practice, when I was beginning to, to do my work with people with physical pain, the issue of sleep just kept cropping up and up and up over and over and over again. Um, and so what I decided to do is to go on and do some additional training, um, kind of top up a psychology degree that I'd done in the past and to learn about how to help my patients more using CBTI because I just benefited from it so much. Um, and as I started to use it with my clients, because we have quite long sessions and I can spend over an hour with somebody, you have the opportunity to drop things in and to start talking about these things. And eventually people just started to come to me um, just to book sessions to talk about sleep. And so my journey as a CBTI therapist just kind of um, spun from there. Wow, that's great. So for CBTI, the whole name, I think, is uh, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy for Insomnia, right? So um, can you explain a little bit what that is because i think we possibly hear cbti or some audience may never heard about it so some yeah. people may not know what that is yeah so cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia it's uh, it's different from cognitive behavioral therapy so a lot of people think that they are the same they might have heard of cognitive behavioral therapy but they think that it might be the same exact thing but you apply it to to sleep and it's a little bit different so cbti addresses the cognitive part, the way we think about sleep um, in order to address things like sleep anxiety and the, the thoughts and behaviors that we start to develop around sleep and our, our beliefs about sleep. So we, we dig into those in that cognitive part. Um, the behavioral part of CBTI addresses sleep behaviors. Um, what do you do when you aren't tired but you feel like you should go to bed? Do you go to bed and lay there and wait to fall asleep or try to sleep? What do you do? So the cognitive behavioral part addresses both the, the thoughts and beliefs about sleep as well as sleep behaviors. Um, and it does this in order to kind of tweak and work with our natural sleeping systems because we have these natural systems that we don't lose just because we're not sleeping well. We just need to kind of use what we can in order to kind of nudge ourselves in the right direction so that we start to sleep a little bit better. Mm, so it sounds like it's a method that not really depends on medication. It's actually Absolutely. behavioral, cognitive, this kind of strategy. Yeah. And one of the things that really appeals to me about it is because is that it doesn't rely on anything external, which is perfect for people who may not be able to take medication. I mean, medication can help you sleep in the short term, but it doesn't actually resolve people's insomnia because insomnia isn't just sleeplessness. <laughs> uh, insomnia is this whole collection of thoughts and behaviors and sleeping patterns that disrupt the natural rhythm of our sleep. And we have to be able to address that from within ourselves. Um, and what's interesting about it is, for me, is that you can't, you can't force it. So you might learn these cognitive strategies as well. You can't force the sleep to happen. So you're working with a natural system that's pretty robust anyway. Um, you just have to develop a different relationship with, with sleep in order to leverage that. And then you begin to sleep uh, more soundly and then longer throughout the process of CBTI. Mm, I like it. We are not trying to control the sleep, sounds like. It's, Absolutely. We changing... have to let go of needing to control it. Absolutely. We have to, one of the things that I think people struggle with the most is the idea of not trying to sleep. <laughs> um, it's almost built into the language that, that, that people use about sleep. Well, I was trying to sleep or I was trying to do this. And it comes up in CBTI 
when I um, talk about relaxation strategies and mindfulness is unless it's presented in a way that uses those strategies for lack of a better word it's not ideal in this particular context if they use these strategies as part of their life as part of their approach to living so that their anxiety level can come down um, so they're not so hyper aroused um, they're, they're going to sleep better but if they use these strategies like a hammer and a nail and they try to go oh i'm not sleeping i'm going to pull out that book where that strategy is i'm going to read it and i'm going to do it and they try to use it to sleep it's probably not going to work very well <laughs> Um, right. Do we really have to more allow sleep to happen by changing how we think about it and changing how we act um, around our sleep? Mm, exactly. Sounds really interesting. So you mentioned when you first get to know this method, there's some personal struggles. So does that mean you used to also... Uh, we're in this cycle of trying to control sleep or cannot sleep very well. Definitely, definitely. So there were a couple of periods in my life. The, the, the first largest one was after my husband died. So kind of in the bereavement process, and people experience these things all the time, um, bereavements, breakups, job losses. Um, this particular experience for me was a bereavement and obviously it disrupted my sleep. And I did what I thought I should do, which is try everything that I could and everything I could find um, to sleep. Now, this was sort of like the days when the internet was just barely around. <laughs> so it was actually probably a good thing that I didn't get to sit up all night and research things on the internet. Um, but I tried all of the, the various tricks that, that people told me to try. I tried... Uh, sleeping in the daytime, uh, going to bed early, staying in bed late, um, and essentially I was training myself to sleep badly. Um, and I don't judge anybody who's in that position because people don't know if they don't have the toolbox, and I didn't have the toolbox at the time. Um, but then having gone through the process of working with somebody around the sleep behaviors in particular, um, that really, really helped sort me out. Um, my thoughts and beliefs about sleep weren't as critical as my behaviors were, I think. Um, and I think that's where not having the internet was really helpful for me because I am somebody who would sit up and just research things to pieces all night long. <laughs> um, and unless you have a broad view of what things mean, you can really go down a rabbit hole trying to find an answer. And that seeking and that trying, I now can see how disruptive it is for people. Mm. Yeah. So like you mentioned, you back then you really did not have the right toolbox. You did find a lot of available tools other people hand over to you. They're just not very effective. So yeah. how did you get to know CBTI? <laughs> um, I met somebody who was familiar with it and they put me on to somebody who did it. And so it just happened to be luck that I found, um, found that, that particular thread. So you never heard about that? I had never heard about it. No, never heard about it. Um, and this was before I had done my degree in psychology, so I wasn't even aware of what CBT was. So I didn't even have the opportunity to be confused by that. Um, um <clears throat> so I thought, well, I've tried everything else. I'll try that too. And it was a very eye-opening experience. Very mm. eye-opening. Mm. In what way? I, I really want to, uh, I'm curious about mm. like to yourself, since you were in this deep struggle and mm. tough time, tough moment in your life, and you know, it's the emotional pain and, yeah. uh, and the, the sleep difficulties a lot of times entangle. So what about CBTI really opened your eyes? I think particularly because I was experiencing a, sort of a massive loss of control of everything in my life um, and not having ever been a control freak, but something like that will really throw anybody. Um, it allowed me to see how my natural sleeping rhythm was supposed to work and how I could influence it. And it almost seemed like it was the only thing I could do anything about, <laughs> um, which is why if I had the internet and was going around looking, I would have tried everything that I could find on the internet now. And I tried everything because I was trying to control my sleep. Um, I was trying to 
in a lot of ways control things I couldn't control besides my sleep, um, kind of as part of the acting out in the, that healing process after his death. But what, it was sleep was something that I felt was tangible because I could measure the daylight out of it. <laughs> um, I could write it all down. I could keep really close track, which is something I now advise people not to do too much. And um, I was really trying to kind of control that because I felt like I had to in order to fix it. And I learned that actually I didn't have to do that. I had to kind of allow the sleep to happen. Um, and I, I look at it now when I have kind of a blip in life, like when lockdown happened and schools closed and my house was in the middle of sale and everything. I had like a, another kind of blip. I had this, this toolbox of like, I can't control this, which is one of the real life benefits of CBTI as well as you learn, you can't control everything. Mm -hmm. um, it changes your perspective on things. Um, but I had this, this toolbox that allowed me to kind of say, okay, I don't have to try to sleep. I've been tired in the day before I'll be tired tomorrow. It'll be okay. The next day is going to come and things, if anything, things always change. And that gives you a great kind of calmness that when I first learned that trick through CBTI, just that, that thought process and changing that thought process, my anxiety level came down and it made it easier to cope with everything. Even though I wasn't necessarily immediately sleeping better, I was able to cope with all of the other drama that was happening in life a lot better because I wasn't so fixated on trying to fix the sleep problem. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So sounds like being able to do something, have the toolbox available for your sleep really empowered you and helped you to start uh, dealing with other chaos, stress in your life much better. And it's so yeah. interesting, like the whole goal originally was to control sleep, but mm -hmm. CBTI, when, when you say toolbox, some people may, may hear and think, oh, toolbox, another toolbox to help me control my sleep. Yes. But I really like what you mentioned, right? <laughs> it actually a lot more than that. No, it's not. It's actually let go of control. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of the um the a lot of the tools that go into the toolbox, you have to know how to use the tools. So sometimes people don't know the tools. Like I didn't know CBTI existed. And within CBTI, especially now that it's developed so much, there's so many different sorts of pieces that get added around the core of it. Um, some of my favorites tend to be kind of meditation and mindfulness. And then when I talk about this, people will say, well, what mindfulness technique should I use to get to sleep at night? And so we have to have this conversation about you can't use these things to control sleep because it's counterproductive. Um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't help for a lot of reasons. One, if you try to use this kind of any kind of strategy to force sleep, you're just going to increase your anxiety about sleep, which is going to make you sleep more poorly. And it comes a bit like a bit of a vicious circle. Um, and the other thing is you're kind of also missing an opportunity because mindfulness and or acceptance and commitment therapy strategies, they shift your perspective on things in life in a way that lowers your anxiety level. And so as I began to learn those, incorporate those in my life, that toolbox that I originally kind of I gathered the core of CBTI material <laughs> and then started adding in these tools along the way that I now share with my clients. And they have changed not just my sleep, but my, my life and my outlook. Mm, yeah. yeah. Well, but the toolbox isn't the, the various different kinds of hammers that you can whack a nail with. It's sort of, you have to know how to use these tools and using them that way is not necessarily helpful. Right, right. So not just about the tools, because some mm -hmm. people can be really rushed. Just give me something to nail Absolutely. my sleep, just like a substitute for medication, right? <laughs> yes, they're, they're desperate. And I totally can understand that desperation. There is nothing more horrible than laying in bed at night, looking at the ceiling and just kind of counting the, counting the minutes, knowing that you're not going to sleep. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy at that point as well. Uh, but I've been there. And like, like I said, I think everybody experiences things in, in their life. Sometimes people will develop insomnia as a result of that sleep disruption. And sometimes they won't. I did. Um, and I still experience sleep disruption. But now I kind of, 
I have kind of have my toolbox. I call it my wellness toolbox. <laughs> Right. So um, you're not afraid and, anymore. I, no, I'm not. I'm not afraid of the lack of sleep. I might be annoyed by it. Um, so I still experience this like a little bit of like a lack of acceptance. <laughs> but when I when I find I'm doing that, I go back to part of CBTI with a stimulus control part. If I'm not feeling accepting of the situation, I get up and I get out of bed um, because that that works for me. Um, now that I'm more experienced in using those tools with the toolbox, sometimes I can just be in bed and it's okay. Mm. But it's difficult for me to, um, and I think for anybody to explain to somebody who's come to come to see me for help that, that first time to tell them to lay in bed and just accept that you're not sleeping because it's not going to work very well. Um, I think it, that takes practice. It takes right. practice. And sometimes so for me, I get annoyed. So then I get up out of bed um, and I just, I really protect my, my bed as that space for me to sleep. And sometimes I go to bed and I think, oh, I'm, I really want to read. And I'm so well conditioned to sleep in my bed now that I can't do it. <laughs> I have to read someplace else. All these are good tips, actually, what mm -hmm. you are mentioning, right? Earlier, you mentioned you did something, trying, you thought they couldn't be helpful, but end up hurting your sleep. Mm, yeah, from from the constant trying, and I think that the things that people are, are told to try, you know, the tip sheets with sleep hygiene techniques and things, they're not necessarily bad things for people who don't sleep badly. Um, they're general good com common sense advice, but they they aren't helpful for people with with insomnia because they don't address the root issue. Um, they could kind of be a top up kind of like icing icing on the cake but unless you have cake in there the whole thing's just going to melt into a heap it's not really going to work um and the, the problem is that people keep seeking after the next thing and the next thing on the list and the next thing on the list and the next thing on the list and get they get really frustrated i was so frustrated i was like i've tried everything am i broken <laughs> what is what's is going on try everything um and it's not that those things were bad in and of themselves. It's just that they weren't the right tool for the particular building that I needed to sort out. Exactly. I think here, um, me and some of my colleagues, we all think like it just like you are um, cleaning your teeth, right? Mm -hmm. If your teeth are very healthy, of course, you just do cleaning, those kind of things, you're great. But if you have cavity, if you really need some teeth surgery and yes. you yeah. still say, I tried everything to keep my teeth clean, mm -hmm. it, it won't solve any real problem. You still have painful teeth. a substitute for a root canal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, a really good, that's a really good analogy. <clears throat> that's a really good analogy. Um, and a lot of those things are good for helping people who sleep really well to kind of protect their sleep a little bit um but i think once you kind of cross that threshold into these thoughts and behaviors and anxieties about sleep and the trying to sleep part it they can't address those things and right. they fall into the category of things that increase sleep anxiety as i as i see it because it's the trying 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 yeah and especially feeling like you failed and it's like over and over and over again yeah yeah and the sleep hygiene stuff you talk about i know people can just google it find a lot of information it's mm. sometimes for people with insomnia it feels like a sense of controlling right i'm gonna manage absolutely. my environment I do. Absolutely. and mm. yeah the frustration you mentioned i i feel it's so real and i hear from so many people friends and it's just it, it, it won't work just by itself then um for our listeners, when, what kind of time they should consider, okay, uh, this is far more than normal, I need to consider CBTI. What, what make people, you know, good candidate or um, should consider the, the CBTI as an option? Right. I would say um, it's sometimes difficult for people to see their own thoughts and fears about sleep. But one really obvious one that comes to mind is when somebody says, I'm really, really tired. I'm getting, I'm sleepy. I've had a long day again and I, I'm almost ready to fall asleep and I go to bed and I put my head on the pillow and then it's like, 
I am wide awake. I think that person's probably a great candidate for CBTI. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, because they they're whatever the behaviors have been they're conditioned to to be alert awake and on high high vigilance level when they're when they're in their bed no matter how sleepy they are so i think that that, that per, kind of person is a good candidate i think somebody who <clears throat> who knows that they're afraid to go to sleep because they know it's just going to be a really difficult night again is probably another person who might be a good candidate um Obviously, there are there are some people for whom CBTI is not appropriate, but if you are not in that category of people and you fit those other two, I would say you should definitely ask about getting a referral. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So um, for um, so for CBTI and how long normally to take this method to really start working? How long people should expect? you know when they think oh i want to try this method but does is that method take really really long and right. what that may look like so i think in part because it depends on each person and what the exact kind of intervention is but i've seen some people sleep turn around in three to four weeks um, and sometimes it takes people longer if you look at kind of the standard cbti if you can get eight sessions certainly by then you have all of the tools that you need kind of bring to, to you and then you've learned how to apply them in a safe environment and you've experimented and you had somebody to guide you you can then take that with you to continue improving um, how much sleep you get but i often will see in in a within a month for a lot of people at least their sleep quality will improve that usually happens first and then they begin to sleep more and more mm. how that was certainly my experience as well um, uh, yeah Mm -hmm, definitely. I think uh, similar to what I see, like around four sessions, some people even less than four sessions already have better improvement and some people need more than six, some people less than six sessions can uh, improve and dep also depends on whether it's group and individual. Yeah, I think a similar observation is what you experienced. Um, you mentioned the sleep quality. So uh, I think some of our listeners may be curious about, you know, what are some uh, good measurements for sleep quality? Like if I want to know whether my sleep quality is okay or not good, uh, what are some things I can use to tell? Right. I, I find that a lot of people um, who begin to start working on their sleep will start to write things down, especially when you start talking about diaries. And the number is not the important thing in the beginning, especially. Um, so it wouldn't be a measurement based on how much you've slept, but how you feel during the day. Um, what I've seen in people is that they will, they'll feel a certain way when they start. They may, they may not be getting more sleep or maybe just a little bit more sleep than they had before, maybe by week three or four. But they're like, I feel like I can cope with my day so much better because the sleep is more solid. So the measurement is much, it's a more subjective measurement. Um, <clears throat> we can get lost, I think, sometimes in the kind of academia of, um, you know, increasing, changing sleep by a certain number of minutes and writing everything down. And that can be counterproductive for some people because it goes right. back to that trying and that controlling and the, um, the monitoring piece of it how you feel during the day is the important thing um, right mm -hmm. yeah similarly when you talk about the tracking i think the sleep tracker sometimes can really cause more harm than be helpful yeah. mm -hmm. absolutely i ask my clients not to use them <laughs> you, you can use it after you've gotten over your insomnia if you're curious <laughs> good idea uh, i mean i i wear one but i don't use it to measure my sleep um and it, it is it's satisfying to do measurements. I, I find, it, find it satisfying. So when I got the Fitbit, I started watching and I'm like, oh, I'm gonna set up the sleep tracking app. I'm just gonna see. And I know in my brain that they, A, they're not accurate, but it, it makes you want to check it because it's information that's available. Um, so even though I don't have a sleeping problem anymore, it's kind of addictive to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I really try to advise people who are struggling with their sleep to uh, basically, if you, if you need an alarm clock in the morning, that's fine. Turn it around and put it on the other side of the room 
or put it in another room so you actually have to get up and go in the other room to turn it off. Um, don't look at your phone to see what time it is after you've gone to bed. Don't look at your watch, take it off, turn off your apps. That's a good point. I'm wondering for some people who are so in control, they're like, have you ever met anyone? They are not willing to do that. They are not willing to let go of the, the clock, the time, the tracking. They are just like so anxious, so unsettled. It's very difficult for them to follow your suggestions. I have, and I, it, they tend to, if they get better, they get better slower um, because they have that, that level of anxiety. And, and if somebody has what seems to be a, a very high level of clinical level anxiety, I'll often refer them and try to refer them to somebody with, with some knowledge in sleep or we work kind of more collaboratively um, because you have to become confident enough in your natural ability to sleep to let go of that need to control it um, and if somebody's used to only getting a few hours of, of sleep like their desperation for that attachment is greater I think and um, so they, they cling to it a little bit more than somebody who maybe get more, more sleep than that right um, depending on how how much they view that as a as a bad thing as a threat um some people will get a few hours of sleep and they they're not as fussed as somebody who gets seven but they're really really worried that they're not getting eight whatever um, yeah. and that myth that myth of the eight hours drives a lot of people's anxiety as well um they they read on internet forums you know, you're going to have all these horrible diseases if you don't get eight hours of sleep every night and uh, doesn't it's not not true necessarily and it's um it's not helpful not helpful information definitely definitely yeah that's interesting when you mentioned this it reminded me of the hyper arousal component you mentioned very at the very beginning so yeah. i know for people with insomnia they possibly have a lot of anxiety about sleep itself and possibly have anxiety about other things too for some of them yeah. what's kind that of one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how does it relate to hyperarousal? How hyperarousal relate to sleep? Right. Um, so that kind of hyperarousal, at least in my experience, it, it will permeate everything in in a in a person's life. In some ways, that hyperarousal becomes functional to overcome the fatigue during the day, so that people can do the things that they need to do. The problem is that you can't then switch. The, you can't flick that switch and, and turn it off. So pe people will sleep really lightly and they'll, they'll think they're not sleeping. <laughs> and sometimes they're sleeping and then it, it's difficult to know without a, without a sleep study. But I suspect in a lot of people who claim they don't sleep at all ever are sleeping. They're just so hyper aroused that they're, they're just below the surface of their conscious kind of waking brain <laughs> all the time because they're, feeling threatened all the time and I think mindfulness practice can be helpful in kind of reducing that overall level of, of arousal uh, it takes a lot of practice um, and I suggest usually people practice on things that are not as threatening as losing sleep um, again to avoid using techniques and strategies like hammers on a nail but to use them in in everyday situations that are not so kind of emotionally loaded um, or perceived as threatening um, so you develop a little bit of skill and practice in using these things to kind of bring that level of arousal down over time it's definitely not an overnight um, an overnight thing by any stretch <laughs> mm. Yeah, I like these suggestions you gave that how to help people, you know, not to look at the clock and not checking their sleep. And if they are too hyper rods, which gets into the way of their sleep, they should consider maybe mindfulness, this kind of training, this practice can be helpful to yeah. really bring them more to the connect, in connect with their uh, physical symptoms, their present moment, possibly can really lower that activity. Yeah. Some people, some people look at mindfulness and meditation as kind of a bit in the woo category, um, but there's actually really good evidence that the way that you you think and you perceive things ha has a neurophysiological effect. 
and 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 has a really direct observable effect. Um, so I would try to focus on that piece of it rather than pushing it, pushing these as opportunities away as kind of being metaphysical. I, I certainly did at the beginning because um, I kind of like I want the evidence and I'm, I was definitely in one of the trackers. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it took me a while to kind of realize, actually, I just let go of my idea of myself as only doing things a certain way and open myself up to this. And there's evidence for it. I'm missing a trick if I if I don't try to view this as an opportunity. And those opportunities help me in my life kind of more, more broadly as well. Um, and there's so many different strands of those things um, that you can explore and see kind of what what tugs at you and what kind of resonates with you um yeah. right um, there i mean is i would say look on the internet it, it, it's got its pluses and its minuses doing that um yeah, yeah. definitely mm -hmm. so how people can find more good information about cbti like do you write anything like your do you have a blog introduce about that or is there any like uh, reasonable resources that reliable resources people can turn to mm. so um, there are some registers of people who practice CBTI if people want to get in in contact um, with somebody who is a, a clinical professional um, in the states I would have to look them up I think the University of Pennsylvania um, they have a list, literal, yeah. has a, has a list. Mm -hmm. um, and there are others um, in different different parts of the world um, certainly if you are interested in the kind of the more mindfulness side of things, there are a million different, um, <laughs> to almost too many, too much choice. Um, I say pick something and, and go with it. And there are mindfulness centers everywhere, um, literally ev on every corner, whether they're open now at the, at the moment or not. A lot of things going on on Zoom as well. Um, in terms of CBTI and, and, and my work, people can find me online. I'm uh, tracytheSleepCoach.co.uk. Um, I put the website up not too long ago. There are a few posts there, um, and I also run a Facebook group called Sound Sleep Strategies, which is based on CBTI and other related evidence-based um, techniques for helping people improve their sleep. And I'm on Instagram, <laughs> Instagram Great. and Pinterest. Same thing, Tracy, Tracy the Sleep Coach. I like Try to it, keep it, Tracy the Sleep Coach. <laughs> yeah. easy to remember and easy to find mm. Mm. yeah i will put all this information in the show notes also for people to click to to look to refer back to yeah yeah i'm happy to put together a list of um uh, resources and contact places for people um i can certainly do that for the uk and probably the us as well Oh, definitely. That would be great. I can also put it on the website. Um, my podcast website has a resource list. I put like ASM website and how to mm -hmm. find the sleep center website. I believe you pens literal possibly are there too. Yeah. But um, if there's any good resource around the UK or anything you know, I would love to get that from you and put it on Fantastic. the website. Great. Yeah, I hope more people get to know CBTI. Yes, I really the, do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. At the end of the show, um, I'm thinking, you know, if all the listeners are listening right now, they are, you know, um, have some sleep concerns. Um, what if you have one thing you want to say to them, what that may be? I think worrying too much and trying too hard to sleep because we can't control sleep um, is only counterproductive. Right, right. Yeah, hopefully when people hear this, this sentence, they already listen to the whole show, they get a basic idea that mm. our biology can be so strong. So trust our body, trust our own biology. Our you sleep system forget. is not broken. We are not broken. It is not broken and you, you can't, forget how to sleep. Mm, I like that. Yeah. yeah, this is wonderful, Tracy. Very nice talking to you about CBTI. I think you possibly are the first guest on the podcast really trying to explain in and ins and outs about CBT for insomnia, CBTI, this method for our audience. Oh, it's been really fun. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it.
Yeah, thank you. Hopefully, we get to connect in the future、uh, episodes. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. I will talk to you later. Thank you. Bye.、Mm -hmm. Bye. Thank you for watching our videos or listening to our podcast. If you like our show, please feel free to subscribe, like, and share it. If you have any questions or feedback, we would always love to hear from you. You can either email us or leave feedback on our website at mindbodygarden.com, or directly under the YouTube video channel. Thank you very much for your company today, and hopefully to hear from you or have you with us next time. Thank you.